12 this morning. I've entitled The War of the Ages. H.D. Uh, Wells had The War of the World. Some of you know that. But this is The War of the Ages. As we get a chance to look at this uh, wonderful passage, uh, it's an amazing passage indeed. Before we look at Revelation chapter 12, our text, uh, to keep your finger there and go to Ephesians. I want to remind you that, uh, that life here and now is, is warfare. It's absolute warfare. We forget that. Sunny uh, June morning, you know, and we come here freely and, and after a night of sleep. But we're in constant warfare. As a believer, the world, the flesh, and the devil, well, I, I mean, it's... It's harder for a believer to live life in this broken world than it is for a non-believer. I mean, Satan already has that in the world system and all that. But now, a 180-degree turn, God calls us and saves us, and now the world, the cross before us, we're seeing the world behind us, and whoa, it's difficult. There are opposers and enemies, and the flesh is weak, the spirit's willing there's a world system that is antithetical to God. They killed his Christ. The, the world, the flesh, that's not bad enough. When God saves us, we still have a lot of Canaan still in our heart, a lot of the flesh, right? Bit by bit, and we struggle with that. We're, we're sinners being saved. We are saved, but sanctified. we're being saved. Be being conformed to the image. God, we're his workmanship, but we fail we're talking about that even this morning. You can have disagreements in your family. You can shout, yell, and, and sometimes as a kid, as a young father, sometimes it wasn't just heaven putting the kids in the car and driving to church. Sometimes it was pretty messy. And now, we, now we're in church and we're singing and all that. They're like, whoa, it's crazy, you know? Uh, and so through much uh, difficulty, we enter into eternal life, Acts 14. So the world, the flesh, if that weren't enough, we have an adversary of our soul, Satan. Satan. So, and he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that tempted Eve. He's, he was a created angel. You can read about that. He was one of the most powerful angels in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. And uh, he was created at the very beginning after creation. It wasn't from ions in the past. Creation was around 6,000 years ago or so. He was created just then at that very time when God made in six days everything in the heavens and on the earth. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 11. That includes the angelic realm. And when he fell, because he sought to be God and to be worshipped of God, God, he fell, and he influenced a third of the, the myriads of angels. He's uh, superhuman. They're above us for a while. When we're glorified, we will reign over them. We're subject to death, so we're lower. But he took one-third of them with him. And they're the demonic folks. You know, we talk about demons and other fallen angels. And Satan disguises himself as an angel of light as he tempts us and, and tries to hinder the church and the program of God at every single point. But I remind you, he's created. God is using him for his purpose. You never need to fear him. He's only in one place at a time. He's not on the present like God. Now he has myriads of demonic angels that will also influence the demonic forces that, uh, that exist. And we're going to look at that in Ephesians 6. Just read that quickly. But, uh, and so on. And one other thing I want to make clear. I read that this week and thought about it. A lot of times Satan is thought of as always oh, he's like red with a pitchfork and, and uh, he's, you know, the, the ear thing there and He's reigning in hell. Hey, yeah, here's the thing. He, he is really beautiful. He, he disguises himself as an angel of light. Beautiful. Even when we see that, there's a beauty about him that, that attracts, uh, inordinately attracts us to this rebel of God. But more than that, do you know that Satan has never been to hell? Some people are like, oh, he died and went to hell. He's with Satan. Satan has never been to hell yet. Never to the lake of fire. He'll be sent there someday, and, and that'll be the it at the end of the ages, hell, when hell in the lake of the fire, and he'll be there forever and ever. He's never been there. 
So he's not in hell. He roams freely. We're going to see the day when he, in the future when he's cast out of the sky and his time is limited on earth, but we never need to fear him. But Paul writes to the Ephesians before we look at our text and just reminds these dear brothers and sisters in Christ of, uh, of the warfare that they're, that they're under here in, in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. He says, finally, talking to Christians, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, put on the armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Let me just stop here. Every morning, Faith and I pray that way. And we do. We just say, Lord, how many now? So, uh, I got this from Charles Stanley. I thought it was good. Yeah, a couple of years ago, and I do it. A helmet now, breastplate of righteousness, uh, right? Do right. Belt of truth, that's Jesus. Binds everything together, feet set. There's a, there's a work to do. Make disciples, carry the gospel, right? Shield of faith. Oh, I need that when it's, you know, you hold that shield to, so to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And the sword, which is the word of God, and the sayings of Christ. It is written. We see Jesus doing that. And then praying on every occasion, right? Always keep on praying for all, all the saints. Oh, my Pray also for me, he said. And so what a, what a wonderful thing. Uh, be strong in the Lord. Now look, go back to verse 12. For he said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people, ultimately and finally. It's not your neighbor, your family, your father, your brother, any of that. It's not human beings. But our war is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, he says, put on the armor of God. Well, go back to Revelation. Just a reminder there that we're in battle. You're in the army now. You're in the army now. You're not behind a plow. You're in the army. You are, and so am I. And we ne need never fear. We're on the victor side. But in the, in the trenches where we find ourselves, uh, we may be under attack and Satan will do depression and his, his uh, cohorts uh, be against us. And if you're really striving to live for the Lord, you're going to feel it even more intense. If you're a believer and you're far removed and you're not walking where you should, well, the Satan has you pretty well where he wants you and so he doesn't bother you much over there. You're like, oh, you're not effective, and you're not growing in grace, and in your life, you're wasting your days. But if you're, Lord, use me today. I want to be a blessing in the place that you have me. You can, I, and we ought to expect opposition. For, what, what's it? For, uh, uh, Peter said, the, uh, Satan is like a roaring lion, walks about seeking to devour believers, not unbelievers, and those that are what we call Christians where they ought not to be living, he doesn't much bother with them as well, and so on. So, the war of the ages. Go back to Revelation chapter 12 as we continue in our series here. I just want to give you some encouragement in case later at the end, like, I don't have time to talk about the armor of God, and what do we do now? I thought I'd do it right at the beginning. Some of you are familiar with John Lennon, the, the Beatle uh, who was killed there on the streets of New York. He once wrote a, a song called Imagine. Some of you know it. Part of the lyrics are horrible. Imagine no heaven. I go, no thank you, John. <laughs> imagine. But in that, he says, imagine a world with no war. No war. Wouldn't that be something? After coming off the last hundred years, there's been more war and destruction and death than in any time in human history. But imagine a world that there's no war that was not existing. And it touches us deeply as we imagine that, as we live in a broken world filled with tears and suffering and death. And all of it is a result of Genesis 3. Never forget that. So one of the most important chapters in the Bible. We go like, what happened? How did we get in this mess? Why is there war? Why is there evil? Why, you know, the great issues and question. And God said that our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of that tree, you can have all of this, all of it. The goodness of God was just so full. All of this, just that one tree there, yeah. you can't have that. And it was, a, it was a test to see if they would love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and strength. And, it, and Satan called in the question, there he is in the garden, our first parents, he's been thrown out of heaven at that point, 
And did God really say it was attack against the Word of God? Did he really say? And God's been doing that all these years. Satan's been doing that all these years, attacking the Word of God. And we're part of a heritage of people that love the Scriptures, love the book. My Bible and I, through all, it is the Word of God, right? Did God really say? Yes, he really did say. And if God really cared for it, he'd let you eat of all of this, but he's holding something back from you. God has said, don't eat it, don't do it. He warned, in the day you eat of that, you will die, and underline it, indeed, in the Hebrew. You'll die indeed. And they did. They, they partook, and spiritually they died instantly. They felt shame and guilt. They tried to hide from God. Man's been trying to do that ever since. How, how, how idiotic is that? It's like when my kids were little, and we play hide and seek. Go hide, go hide, here comes daddy, Right? I know where they're hiding. They're in the, under the bed or in the closet. Where are you? Oh, we're, they're, they're, they're hiding and giggling, and, right? right? Hiding from God. But people try to do that today, try to hide. They do it in a lot of sophisticated ways. But it's all unbelief. They'll hide in their money. Oh, we don't need God. They'll hide in pleasure. Oh, like, you know. Or we'll hide in education and the ivy tower of, of humanism and paganism and all that. They're hiding, hiding, hiding. Well, the day is coming when every man will give an account, every woman, before the Lord. Adam and Eve are hiding. God pursues them. There's the gospel. God's been pursuing men and women through the centuries of time. And he found them hiding, and he provided a substitute for them. You remember that? They tried to cover their, clothe their body, the shame they felt there because of disobedience. And God killed an animal and gave them skins to cover the shedding of the blood their life, the substitute, right at the very beginning in Genesis 3. And then the woman would now have labor. Uh, she'd have more pain in labor. Her husband would rule over her. And there's the battle of the sexes through all the ages. Some men are passive. Some are over-aggressive. Some women are passive. Some women want to... And it, it's this thing. I mean, this, this agitation. And then we see in chapter 4, uh, you know, they're the first children. One's a murderer. Cain kills Abel. I mean, if the first one born is a murderer, what hope is there for the rest of it? I mean, to see the, 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 the sin and the death and the evil at that point through the Genesis chapter 3. It's so vital to have the historic time fall. I read some of these theologians write, well, was Adam really a historical person? What idiocy is that? Just tear your Bible apart and throw it away. Of course he was a literal human being. It, he's the first Adam in Romans 5. The last Adam is Jesus. The, 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 light, the, the one who brought sin and death and the one who brings obedience and life is the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the historicity of Jesus is as valid there as the history and the realness of the first man that God made. Well, in the day you eat of it, you will die indeed. Well, one day soon, back on our sheet, when Jesus returns, he will vanquish the evil one. He's already defeated. Uh, he's defeated at the cross. It was a great turnabout, you know, Satan opposing God, trying to kill this blessed one, finally kills him, but it was the hour, his hour to die, and the big turnabout was the tricker, the evil one, was ultimately deceived, and his, his defeat was there at Calvary, as Jesus triumphed victorious to Telestai. And Satan was defeated. It's like the judge in the court. The judge will say, you are guilty. You are going to be punished in 60 days. We're going to hang you. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. And he's awaiting then, after that, the actual carrying out. And Satan is defeated now. He was defeated at the cross, waiting to that day when he is finally carried out into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And at the end, he'll be hell and it will be cast in the lake of fire and he'll be forever gone. I can't wait. One day when Jesus, he, he will vanquish the evil one. The paradise once lost will be restored. No more sin, death, or war. Imagine that. I say that. Imagine that, John Lennon. Imagine that. Oh, my, you know, can you ever, can you even think about a world without sin, death, obituary, hospital, no doctor, sorry, Rob, no doctor, no one, nothing. Don't even need Band-Aids. 
I don't know what that means. Will we have to brush our teeth? There's a very, my son asked me that one day. Will we have to brush? Sounds like something a boy would say. You know, if we're not going to rot or decay, Dad, do you think I'll have to brush my teeth? I, you know, we can't even imagine a, a world like that. No more police. Talk about defund the police. Won't even need the police. Only the righteous will enter in this. The king will reign in the world. No more curse in Eden. The Edenic conditions of paradise will be restored. And we're going to, and you're not sitting around playing. Some of you think oh, you're going to sit around and play a harp. Forget it. God has given you gifts and abilities, and you're going to labor and work, and creation won't work against you. All right? You're not going to have thorns and thistles in your life. You're not going to come home and say, that person there is a pain in the neck. I can't stand working with them anymore. That boss, right? None of that. I, I, I go like, it's hard to get my head around it. I say, Lord, I'm ready for that. Well, look at the next. The real theme, if you want to summarize the whole book of the Revelation, is really just that, the triumph of God over Satan as evil is purged from the world and Christ becomes our holy king and holy ruler. That being the case, Revelation 12 is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. I don't know if you ever thought about it like this. Here in chapter 12, you're going to see the battle, the war of the ages, and uh, it goes back to the earliest of days, certainly the beginnings, and not, if not only then, but Abraham and the nation of Israel all the way forth to the birth of Christ, and then even after and uh, this, whole, this one chapter just unfolds that, and you get a, a proper view of history and a proper view of prophecy. It becomes utterly plain and clear when you see the significance. Now, the chapter itself is an insert. Now, we've talked about that, that uh, in chapter 1, when John was told to write, to, uh, tell us about chapter 1, the glory of what you've seen, Jesus, and all his wonder moving among the church. And then second part, chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches there to typify all the churches during this mysterious period of time known as the church age. That ends at chapter 4, verse 1, with a come up here. John is uh, the picture of the rapture. The church, the bride of Christ, is just one part of God's program of redemption, all based on the cross, forward and backwards. But we're the bride, the mystery, no Jew, no Gentile. But here's the thing. God made promises to the nation Israel through the prophet. There are tons of promises. The glorious coming day of, of what God would do with the nation Israel, the seed of David, the king. And God always means what he says and says what he means. He's ever faithful. And you and I can count on that. They that have the Son have life. Thank you, Lord. You never lie. You're not like me. Oh, God, thank you. And God made promise of that nation in the, during this last seven years, known as the tribulation, after the church is snatched up, taken the glory to be with the Lord, God will finish his, and fulfill his promise to the nation of Israel. And during that time, that's when Antichrist rises on the scene. He rises, first of all, as a friend to Israel, makes a seven-year pact to provide peace and security. He's probably one of the leaders of the European nations, the European common market there, and the union there, maybe. Some think it's a confederation of the Muslim countries there in the Middle East, but it would seem like it's more the revised Roman Empire European. And he makes this, and after three and a half years, he breaks that. The temple is made there and put together, and there's temple worship in Jerusalem, and he sets up the idol of himself, Antichrist. The, the, he is the incarnate of, uh, incarnation of Satan itself, and he wants to be worshipped, and all hell breaks out on earth in the last three and a half years. As God is regathering Israel, the witness of 144,000, the Jews that are sealed to go around the world to win people, and myriads upon myriads of Jews and Gentiles are saved during this time, and many give their life for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The world and, and, and all that takes place there through the opening of the, of the seals and the trumpets and the, the catastrophe and the earthquakes and every the meteorites falling and the darkening of the sun and the volcanoes. It's horrible. You want, you're just so glad, really. I'd say, like, Lord, 
I don't, I don't have a choice. You know, that we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice of the family we're born in, right? I think, Lord, you made a mistake. I was in the wrong family. No, not really. Never. He never makes a mistake, right? And even that time, you're like, I wish I was born with Christopher Columbus. I could have sailed the ocean blue. You didn't have a choice in that. You don't want that anyway. Believe me, you don't. I mean, we got indoor plumbing. I mean, what more do you want, right? You took a hot shower this morning. I got news for you. They didn't do that a hundred some years ago, unless you were alter, uh, just ultra, ultra wealthy, right? I guess, right? You were in the bathtub after three or four people in that dirty water and that little thing there. That was it. God has us right at this point in time. And he's right on time, and he's going to deal exactly with the nation of Israel according to his promise. It's a glorious chapter. Anyway, Satan has always sought to counter God's plan by his wicked strategy, <laughs> strategy to target Israel and that the nation would give birth to the promised seed, and Satan has sought to destroy the nation. And uh, that's really the way you look at history. From the very beginning, God promised the seed of the woman, and it's narrowed down. And then we find at Genesis 12, it's going to be through Abraham. And not Ishmael, no, not that line. That's the son of the flesh. Mark taught us that in Galatians 4 recently. It's Isaac, the son of promise. And Satan has tried to hinder it every step of the way. Even prior to that, some of you don't realize, but in Genesis 6, Satan tried to destroy the human race. I don't know, it seems far beyond our way of thinking, but in Genesis chapter 6, the demonic forces, part, part of Satan, somehow uh, copulated and cohabited with women and pr produced a mongrel human race, attempting to destroy the Adam's human race so that it would be utterly corrupted and there would be impossible for the line to produce the seed of the woman. Some of you don't know that. Well, read uh, the Second Peter, read Jude. They also talk about these angels that fell, didn't keep their first estate, cohabited with women, somehow produced this seed, the Nephilim, and God judged them, judged them. They're held in the lowest part of hell called Tartarus. Actually, it's easy to remember if you like tartar sauce on your fish. That's a good Greek word. It's, they're tartarized in that realm, the lower realm, Tartarus and being kept in chains. Those that, that cohabit and try to, to corrupt the human race. Satan was behind that to ruin any possibility. When you think of the, of the history, God promised the seed of the woman, he's going to destroy the human race to make impossible for any, any uh, 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 the seed to be born. And so that's part of the reason, a big part of it, why God destroyed all of humanity then in Genesis chapter 6. Noah and the flood. The abomination and the wickedness was unbelievable. And God wiped out the earth except for eight. He started again with Noah, his three sons, and all of us are cousins. Did you know that we're all cousins? We're all cousins. We, we look similar. And we're all part of this, this family. And God narrowed it down. And Abraham, and here comes the line, be through Judah, the line of the tribe of Judah, then through David, 2 Samuel 7, 14. It would be David's son that eventually would sit on the throne. Uh, and, and Satan's hindering every step of the way. He's trying to destroy Moses in that generation in Egypt. Remember that? It was the edict from Pharaoh, destroy all these Jewish Hebrew children the male child, drown them to the midwives. Remember that? Each step of the way, he tries to uh, do it in two ways. You either assimilate, you have God's people, Israel, who the seed is promised that God designed before eternity. He's going to have them either assimilate with the Canaanites and the pagans around so they lose all their identity, or if he can't do that, then he'll destroy them. And that's what his, his two-prong attack has been. And that's why Revelation 12 is so uh, I interesting in that it outlines this whole strategy from the beginning of Satan to confront and war against God uh, all since the beginning of time. And yet God has a plan that will put that uh, opposer of God in the ground. Incidentally, I've said that before. Do you know the promise of God came to with one little baby? You can check that out. Write that on, on your piece of paper. 2 Samuel 22.10. 
<clears throat> there was a time in the, the, the days of the kings uh, when David's line came down to one little baby. There was this Athaliah was all upset that her son, the king, was killed. And she went over there and she killed all of David's survivors, all of them, wiped them out. And there was, it would have been the end of God's promise, except the wife of a priest found the littlest one. His name is Joash. He was just a little, and hid him, hid that baby. I mean, the whole plan of God was hid John, one little baby there. I mean, it's like breathtaking. Some of you like great movies. You're like, oh, what's going to happen next? We're in trouble, right? And here's the plan of the eight down to one little baby there. And at the age of seven, he's announced king, and uh, Athaliah freaks out, and, uh, and finally she's, she is killed. And this young Joash, uh, the, who became the seed, they eventually led to Mary. You can look all the way through, stepfather Joseph, and that's the line of God. The plan of God is unstoppable. So you check that out. Satan has always sought to counter God's plan, by his wicked strategy to target Israel and uh, the nation that would give birth to the promised seed and so on. I just, there's this one writer, I just thought I'd read a little bit of this because in a few paragraphs, if you'll listen, you get the sense of just that, Satan opposing the plan and purposes of God. The author writes, one of the darkest stains on the history of mankind has been the persistence as a perspective of anti-Semitism. That means hatred of the Jew. Over the centuries, the Jews have faced more hatred, more persecution than any other people. Much of that, that suffering was chastisement from God to turn the nation away from their sin and unbelief and back to him. God repeatedly warned Israel the consequences of disobedience. Think of Deuteronomy 28. And he punished them for it when they dis failed to obey. Within the paradigm of God's sovereign purpose for his people also has suffered constant and severely at the hands of Satan. Acting as God's instrument, unlike God, however, Satan's purpose in causing the Jewish people to suffer is not remedial, but it's destructive. He seeks to bring them not to repentance, salvation, but to death and to destruction. Israel faced constant threats from her neighbors during the periods of the judges. And uh, later, the, first nor the northern kingdom of Israel was defeated in 722 by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom in 586 BC by the Babylonians, their enemies. And as a result, the Jewish people lost their independence and became subject to foreign powers, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greece and Greeks, and the Romans. In post-biblical times, the story has tragically been much the same. The history of the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years is a sad litany of prejudice, persecution, the first widespread persecution of Jewish people in Europe took place during the First Crusade. As they made their way across Europe toward Palestine, mobs of unruly crusaders destroyed Jewish homes and villages, massacred their inhabitants. When they captured Jerusalem in 1099, the crusaders uh, unashamedly herded the Jews' population, the Jerusalem population, into a synagogue. Then they set it on fire and burned it down. Most of the Jews perished. The survivors were sold into slavery. How horrible is that? Then King Edward, in case you didn't know it, he, King Edward I banished all Jews from England in 1290. They were thrown out of the country, thus giving England the dubious honor of being the first country to expel its Jewish population. They would not be permitted to return until the time of Oliver Cromwell, three and a half centuries later. France followed suit in 1306, Spain in 1492, and so on. And throughout the Middle Ages, the Jews were blamed for various natural disasters, most notably the Black Death, in, in 1348, and they were savagely persecuted because of it. The 19th century saw an outbreak of anti-Semitism in Russia, where the Jews were blamed for the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, 1881. In the ensuing 
pogroms of the next four decades, tens of thousands of Jews were killed and hundreds of thousands driven from their homes. Nearly three million more were killed during Stalin's reigns as part of the scandalous Dreyfus Affair in French in which a Jewish army officer, Captain Alfred Dreyfus was falsely convicted of treason. Only after 12 years of public turmoil over the case was he exonerated. But the da- darkest hour in the long history of anti-Semitism was yet to come. In the early 1930, the Nazi party came to power in Germany, and uh, their insane racial theories became public policy. Unlike others who had persecuted the Jewish people, the Nazis and their maniacal leader, Adolf Hitler, did not merely seek to persecute them, but sort, sorted, uh, uh, tr- uh, tried to eliminate them. In the Holocaust, they ensued what the Nazis sought to implement called the final solution to the Jewish problem. Six million Jews, more than half of the Jewish population, of they were slaughtered. But despite millennia of savage persecution, the Jewish people survived. It was satanic inspired behind all of that. Never a people like that, never a people have survived that. It is the fervent hope of the Jewish people that the horrors of the Holocaust will never again be repeated. Tragically, however, they will, as the Bible warns, that a time of suffering lies ahead for Israel that will be far worse than anything the nation has endured in the past. Jeremiah called that time the time of Jacob's distress. And Jesus described it as the great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now. The tribulation will be the worst times for Israel for two reasons. During that seven-year period of time, God will pour out his final fury on the unrepentant and unbelieving world, including unrepentant rebels of Israel. And at the same time, Satan will make his last desperate attempt to prevent the promised reign of the Lord Jesus on Israel's throne and thus negate the salvation and the kingdom promised to Israel. He will savagely assault the Jewish people, seeking to destroy both those Jews who have already come to faith in Christ and those who still might. The devil will do everything in his power to hinder the ministries of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists and the two witnesses. But Satan's efforts will not succeed. His worst fears will come about. Well, in our text today, we... If you, if you glance at your scriptures, uh, at the end of chapter 11, uh, we see the seventh trumpet that's announced in verse 15. That's the seventh trumpet. The angel sounds it, uh, the trumpet. It's the final one. And there were loud voices in heaven that said, it's a proclamation. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders, that's the church, they represented you and I, who were seated at the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped, saying, and, and we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, and because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were angry, and, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, for destroying those who destroy the earth. Now, the trump, trumpet sounds, and the trumpet then un, unfolds, opens up the seven, that seven trumpet opens up the seven vials, or the bowls of wrath that are going to come. Now, it's simply the announcement is made at the trumpet sounds, and uh, we go into a, a parent, an inset, or a parent, uh, we stop the forward motion of the, of the seals, the trumpet seven, and before the vials or the bowls of wrath come, there are several, there's a total of seven insets. We looked at some last week, and the insets are there. They stop the forward motion of it, the chronology, to give explanation and give a res- respite to us as we look at it and, and give some explanation as to what's going on. That's what we have today in chapter 12. It's, it's an inset. Now, the best way to think, I, did you, someone had fireworks going last night. Did you see that? I was looking out our kitchen window, I like, 
wait a minute, it's not the 4th of July. What's going on? I don't know what that was. Was that the Senator's game or something? Were they home? Anyone know about that? Was that your backyard, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I thought, you know what? A good way to think about the, the seven seals on the title deed, and you open the seventh seal, and there were seven trumpets, and then you open the seven trumpets, and then we're going to see there's seven vials right at the end of this tribulation period. The wrath of God's going to fall. It's like the fireworks. You know, when you, they, they shoot the fireworks, you're like, oh. And then when it, you think it's all over, all of a sudden there's a, another burst, and you're like, oh. And then you're like, oh. And then there's another, you're like, oh. That's what we're talking about here. I, they'll never forget that now. It's like that, that, that expensive fireworks that just, just keep coming like that. And uh, that's what we have. The first blast goes up, and then you think, it's, oh, there go, and there's the seven trumpets, and there comes the seven trumpets. There's the seven trumpets. Best way to think about that when you think of the chronology and the flow of this book. Well, there are three war campaigns that are waged against our Savior who will crush him when he returns. And the blast of the seventh trumpet ushers in the beginning of the end and introduces them. Now, we don't have time to develop all this, but hopefully you got the sheet. But there are three war campaigns. The first one is the one that we already spent a lot of time in. the inter- It's the Ancient of Days. It's Satan trying to hinder a God in his work all the way through. All the way through. Right? Jesus is born finally. He tried to hinder Jesus coming, but when Jesus comes, then what's he do? He, he inspires Herod to have an edict, kill all the babies. Wipe them out there in Bethlehem. Two years in yard. Remember that? He's, now he's trying to hinder them all the way. And he, and he flies, and Jesus goes to Egypt with his mom and dad. Then to Nazareth. He's there. He grows up in Nazareth, and finally the day comes after his baptism. He announces in the synagogue there that he's quoting uh, about he's the Messiah, and this is the day. And the hometown crowd rushes him to the precipice, and they're trying to kill him. That's Satan inspired. He's trying to kill him all the way through. If that weren't enough, you have Satan tempting him in the wilderness here. Try, just bow down, disqualify him from being the one all the way through. And, and you see the intensity of this all the way through. They're trying to kill him, trying to uh, uh, cut him short. It's all satanically inspired. That's all I'm trying to say here. And we see that. Look at, at verse 1. And a great and a wondrous sign appeared in the heaven. A woman, this is going to be Israel clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and crown of 12 stars in her head. It's a picture of Genesis 37 when Joseph shared his dream uh, of the future with his dad. It's Israel. And she was pregnant. And she cried out in pain. And as she was about to give birth, all right, she was pregnant. It's a durative word. It's talking about when the promise was made, and now all these years waiting for her to come, Mary, all the way through, all the way through, viewing all of this history, all this opposition, all this Satan, trying to disqualify and destroy the seed that would bring about the Lord Jesus Christ. Then another sign appeared in the heaven, an enormous red dragon. This is Satan, the second personality here. With the seven heads, he's a governmental leader, and ten horns, and seven crowns on his head, and his tail, here it is, his tail swept a third of the stars, those are angels, out of the sky and flung them to the earth. He took one third of the angelic realm and days back with him in his rebel against God. And now notice this, the dragon stood in front of the woman. The woman is Israel, and time, Mary, the woman will come and give birth, and here's Satan standing right in front of the nation of Israel trying to destroy her and eliminate the possibility of the birth of Jesus, who was about to give birth. That described about, what, 2,000 years, so that he might uh, devour the child. That's Satan trying to destroy Jesus. In the moment... The child was born. She gave birth to a son, the male child, that's Jesus, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. 
and her child was snatched up to God. Now, in between that verse and snatched up to God, it's the whole ministry of Jesus. She gives birth, and there's the 33 years. He dies, he's buried, he's ascended. He's in heaven now. Satan did not, didn't know that that was going to happen. He thought when he had finally got Judas to do his dastardly deed, he had won, but he didn't. And in that, he was crushed. It was a head wound. And the child was snatched to heaven. There's the ascension to his throne. And the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared by God. Now, in verses 1 to 5, we see the war of the ancient days, the beginning. Satan sought to foil God's plan of a redeemer through the nation. The woman here is Judaism or the nation of Israel. She's continuously with child as, as generations kept going, going, going. And then finally Mary, the beloved one who was God's in instrument to bring his son into the world. The entire message of the Old Testament is summed up from Genesis to Malachi in the one verse here. It's amazing. And the arrival of the man-child is Jesus, born in Bethlehem, Isaiah 7, 14. The dragon symbolically represents Satan. He led a third of the angels against God at just after creation. Isaiah 14, you can check. He stood before the one. It's a present tense. He stood there. It was durative through all those centuries of time, trying to hinder and, and annihilate and destroy that he might devour him. Boy, that's a statement. It covers all that time. He sought to prevent the entrance of Jesus from the earth, but he could not. That's the war of ancient days. That's what's going on up to this point. And then he talks about quickly the second front. It's an aerial, and it's in the future. And, it's, and in, it's, it's verses 7 to 12, here during the seven-year period of time when we're in glory as the church, and God is regathering Israel, and many are being saved, but Antichrist is ruling. It's a horrible time on earth. And we discover in this text, in verse uh, uh, 7 to 12, the war that's in heaven with Michael, the archangel. And there was a war in the heavens. And Michael, he's the angel for Israel, and his angels fought against the dragon. That's Satan. And, and, the, and the dragon, it, it, the dragon is, is might and power and so on. And his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in the heavens. This is still in the future now. And look at verse 9. This is an interesting verse. That great dragon was hurled down. And who is he? He's the ancient serpent. Now we know who he is. From Genesis 3, you got to go all the way to Revelation 12, 9 to discover, wait a minute, the serpent there was the devil. The serpent, 12, 9, identifies him, and uh, he is the one that uh, he's called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray, and he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And you, we keep going to the proclamation, now have come the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, that's what Satan does before the throne when we sin, he brings our name up and says, that's your, one of your children, look at that. He accuses us before our Father in heaven. And it says here, night and day he does that. He has been hurled down. You see, in the future, during the tribulation period, this aerial battle uh, between Michael and will finally throw Satan down. He will no longer have access to the throne of God. He's confined to earth. He knows his time is very limited, and he is going to wreak havoc and destruction upon the earth that now he's been confined to. And that's exactly what he does in the second, the war of the heavens. And finally, the third war we see in verses 13 to 17, as he sets his attack now on the nation of Israel in the latter days of the seven-year period of time, while you and I who know Jesus are in heaven, we see the final war where Satan mobilizes all his military might against the nation of Israel. Just look at that quickly, and, and we'll be going. Look at verse 13. And when the the dragon, Satan saw that he had been hurled to the earth. This is in the future. 
He pursued the woman, that's Israel, who had given birth to the male child, that's Jesus. He's pursuing the nation of Israel, and the woman was given two wings of, like a great eagle. That means she could move with protection. God protected her, and with great speed, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, the wilderness, where she would take uh, care, where she would be taken care of for, for three and a half years out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman. God sent an earthquake and swallowed them. So what's going on here? So we, we have all this turmoil on. Satan's confined to earth. And this last, this is the ancient war, the aerial war. And finally there, the, he sets a sight on destroying the Jew in Israel. And, and some of the is, uh, Jews read and understand understand the words of the Lord now in Matthew 24, 15. When you see these things, run like mad to the wilderness. Run. And if you're pregnant, woe unto you. If you're nursing, woe unto you. Don't even go and get your coat. Go. That's what Jesus is talking about in the Olivet. And they flee into the wilderness, the rocky or Maybe it's Petra. We don't know. But Satan is foiled. The Antichrist cannot get them because God protects them. Maybe it's like the protection God had with the nation of Israel when they left Egypt. He protected them. They couldn't. And for three and a half years, it drives them insane. He can't get them. And he musters all the armies. Sounds like the UN, right? He brings all these armies down. We're going to crush them. And God intervenes with a great earthquake, and it swallows them up. You know, God did that in the numbers. Did you read that? The rebellion, and God just opened, going, opened the earth, and there they went. I love that where it says, and they went live down into the earth. Well, King James had a description of that. God defends these people during this terrible time. And then when Satan sees that the armies that were flowing like a river, they were just masses defeated, he turns back toward Jerusalem because not all the Jews left, and he sets his sight on that, and he is going to destroy every last Jew, and we get a glimpse here, because we don't get any details, he's going to wait for the coming chapters, namely chapter 19, where then at that point, the Lord and the church and the saints they return, and they fight in that battle, the end of the battle of Armageddon, and one word from his mouth defeats Satan, Antichrist, and it's over. We'll see that more in detail tale in the days to come. Listen, there's a real battle going on. Thank you for your patience. A real battle going on, even now. Satan seeks to devour us, but we're on the victor's side. If you've never come to Christ, come to Christ and be saved. Be on the victor's side. We're, we're out of here, you know? And the Lord is coming back, and we're going to be with him forever and ever and ever Imagine that. No more war. No more battle. No more sin. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, Lord. Father, thank you for this wonderful passage. Forgive me for not being able to teach it better. I tried the best. But Lord, use it in my life and in our hearts to realize, A, that you're sovereign, that you're faithful, and you're faithful with us, and that heaven is our home, and may we redeem the time. The days are evil as we look for and say, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you're faithful to fill, fulfill every last promise that you made, not only to the nation of Israel, but to us. And the best is yet to come, Lord. We love you with all our heart. In Jesus' name. Shall we stand as we sing? Afflicted saint, to Christ draw near, your Savior's gracious promise here is faith.